<laughs> thank you, Nina. <laughs> It's, uh, it's just wonderful to be here today, and I thank Kenna, Kenny and Nina for inviting me. When I get up in the morning and open my closet door, I see a sign that says, Good morning, beautiful business. And it's a daily reminder to me of just how beautiful business can be when we put our creativity and our energy and our care into producing a service or a product for our community. Economic exchange can really be one of the most meaningful of human interactions. Uh, when I see that sign in the morning, I, I think about um, the um, farmers out in the fields uh, picking fresh fruits and vegetables to bring into the cafe that day. And I think about the farm animals, the pigs and the cows and the chickens out there in pasture enjoying fresh air and sunshine. Our goat herder, Dougie Newbald, who says that when she kisses her goat's ears, it makes the cheese better. <laughs> I think of the bakers coming in, putting cakes and pies in the oven, and the maintenance crew making sure everything is clean and repaired before the guests arrive. I think of the Indians down in Chiapas, Mexico, picking the organic coffee beans <laughs> for our morning cup. Business is about relationships. Money is simply a tool. Business is about relationships with everyone we buy from and sell to and work with, and about our relationship with Earth itself. My business is the way I express my love for the world, and that's what makes it a thing of beauty. The first time I walked onto the street where I live and work today in 1972, I was enchanted. The narrow tree-lined street with a row of charming, if somewhat run-down Victorian brownstone houses was a little oasis from the unfriendly institutional feeling that surrounded it. Most of the old houses around the University of Pennsylvania were being torn down and replaced by modern high-rise dormitories and office buildings and strip malls and parking garages. In contrast to all that, uh, the lovely 100-year-old houses on Stan Sansom Street with a few small businesses on the first floors were human scale, quaint and homey and inviting. But just after I moved into an apartment at 3420 Sansom Street, future home of the White Dog Cafe, I learned that the entire block was condemned to be torn down to make way for a shopping mall. How could it be that these lovely brownstone houses would be demolished and local business owners and residents forced out to build chain stores and fast food restaurants? I was outraged. This must have been my first Bali moment. I eagerly joined our local community group organized to fight the demolition and save our, our homes and businesses. We developed an alternative proposal to the shopping mall based on the vision of urban activist Jane Jacobs, author of Death and Life in Great American Cities, who fought to save her own community in Greenwich Village from the wrecking ball. Jacobs talked about the importance of mixed use, where communities prospered with a diverse and lively mixture of residential and retail, where people could live and work and go to school and find leisure activities in the same walkable communities. Jacobs challenged the urban renewal movement, movement of the 50s and 60s, where whole neighborhoods were raised and destroying vibrant communities and thriving personalized local businesses to build sterile high-rise office buildings and housing projects. Walkable communities were replaced by car-dependent suburbs, where housing plans and shopping malls destroyed rich farmlands for no more than what Jacobs called cheap parking. Pe people no longer walked, worked in the same community where they lived. Work life and family life became separate. Studies show that it was this time in the 1950s when people were separated by migration to the suburbs when happiness in America's society began to decline. It was also the time of increased industrialization of agriculture where farmers, stewards of the earth, began to be forced off their farms by corporate farms and developers, and consumers lost this personal link with the earth and with our food. Today we no longer know who grows our food, who bakes our bread, who brews our beer, who sews our clothes, who builds our houses. We become disconnected from each other and from our places. Without these direct relationships, few of us think of the consequences of our economic transactions have on other people and communities and animals and nature. Like the family farm, family inn, and other traditional family businesses, I live above the shop in the old-fashioned way. Living and working in the same community has not only given me a stronger sense of place, but a different business outlook. Making business decisions in the best interest of the common good comes naturally when those affected are friends, neighbors, and employees, and the environment I experience every day. There's a short distance between me uh, as the business decision maker and those affected by my decisions, a basic principle of Bali. As a small business owner, I'm more likely to make decisions from the heart, and I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Uh, one was the concept of paying a living wage. When I first heard about this, I had the typical business person's knee-jerk reaction, no one's going to tell me how much to pay my staff. 
But one day I was down in the kitchen and I looked at, uh, just by coincidence, three young men uh, looked up at me while they were prepping vegetables. And I thought to myself, of course I want these three young men to make a living wage. How could I think otherwise? For someone that works 40 hours a week in the White Dog Cafe, not to be able to buy their food and pay the rent, of course I want to pay a living wage. What have I been thinking? Uh, mm. On another occasion, I was influenced by my direct relationship with nature. I had heard about the problem of global warming, the idea of sustainable energy. Uh, I understood the principles intellectually, but I hadn't been moved yet until there was a drought in Pennsylvania about eight years ago. And I went up to my special little place where I like to hike in the Poconos and found that the leaves were falling off the trees in July and all the beautiful big ferns were all crumpled up like brown tissue paper and the creek was dry as a bone with just dust on the rocks. And as I walked through the woods and the, all the cre creakiness of the dried branches and leaves beneath my feet and there was an eerie, eerie silence otherwise, not even the birds were singing and there was just a sense of fire in the air. And it was as though the, the woods uh, expressed this stress. And I became a tree hugger. I went over to this big oak tree and I hugged this tree and I thought, oh my God, this is what it's gonna be like with global warming, with droughts and fires in some parts of the world and floods and storms and others. And I put my face against the bark and promised that I would do something about global warming. So I went back to town and told my office to find out about how we could sign up for alternative energy. And we became the first business in Pennsylvania to get 100% of our electricity from renewable sources. <laughs> Thank you. But when business continually grows larger and larger, that distance between the decision maker and those affected grows longer. Yet business schools teach grow or die, bigger is better rather than small is beautiful. And success in our society, in our business world, is measured by material gain. We're taught that the, the false premise that economic growth benefits everyone. Yet continual growth is destroying the planet, and it's the rich that get richer, while the share of wealth for the rest is actually declining. Though the U.S. is less than 5% of the world population, we use more than 25% of natural resources, we pollute more than 25% of the pollution, and we jail more than 25% of the world's incarcerated people. With all that material wealth and consumption, studies show that Americans are less happy than we were 50 years ago, and less happy than our European counterparts. And we're, and we're less healthy as well. Uh, we have this uh, unhealthy diet of uh, fats and sugars that has caused an epidemic of obesity. There was a time when I questioned uh, my success because I didn't have two or three restaurants, but I made a conscious decision to stay small because I realized that being one special restaurant uh, rather than growing, I would be able to maintain uh, what was really important to me, which was the authenticity of the relationships I had with my customers and staff and suppliers and community uh, that I would lose. I came to understand that success could be measured in other ways than growing materially, by increasing knowledge, by expanding our consciousness, by developing our creativity, by de deepening relationships, increasing happiness and well-being, and having more fun. <laughs> At the White Dog Week Cafe, we grow deeper through our many community-based programs, such as Nina mentioned today. Education has become a product of the White Dog. We take our customers on solar house tours, teach them how to conduct energy audits of their homes, how biodiesel works, where our food comes from. We take them on tours of farms, of prisons, uh, child watch tours uh, to witness the lives of inner city children. We took 35 customers and staff down to New Orleans to volunteer after Katrina. <laughs> Some people say that my real profession is using good food to lure innocent customers into social <laughs> activism. <laughs> One of the most important and effective things we do at the White Dog is to buy from local farmers. And for many years, I, I knew the importance of buying uh, pastured eggs and chicken. Um, but I had never heard about the atrocities of the factory farming of pigs until back in the 1990s I read John Robbins' book. Uh, there I learned about this barbaric uh, way in which pigs are raised in confinement with unspeakable pain and deprivation, unable to move forward or backward, standing on these con on concrete uh, with a drain where their excrement goes down into a lagoon and then goes off to pollute the, the water in the community, never enjoying a, a breath of fresh air or sunshine. Um, although these animals are really social, uh, they're kept from t touching other pigs. They usually sleep in big piles of, of, of pigs. Um, they love to socialize and are highly intelligent. The sows are artificially inseminated, prohibiting them from 
uh, building nests and caring for the young as their instincts call them to do. Their babies are taken away prematurely and then they're artificially inseminated again, over and over, as though they were just machines in a factory. Pigs are not machines. They are intelligent, social, sentient beings with feelings and emotions like other mammals, like our dogs, like ourselves. It's a violation of nature to treat them in this cruel and inhumane way. It's a betrayal of our sacred duty as stewards of farm animals and it's institutionalized cruelty that's destroying our own humanity. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was horrified to think that the pork that I was serving at the White Dog was actually coming from the system, as almost all pork does um, in our industrialized uh, economy. I, I could not participate in this system that I saw as being evil, so I came into the kitchen and I said, take all the pork off the menu, the bacon, the pork chops, the ham. Uh, we can't serve this until we can find a uh, humane, a sustainable uh, farmer. So uh, our chef set out to, to do that and, and asked the uh, man who was bringing in our free-range chickens if he could find some traditionally raised pork, and he was able to. And we started buying two, two, porks, uh, two pigs a week and needing to know how to use all the parts of the pig. Next, I discovered the terrible way that cattle are raised. Um, cattle, of course, are herbivores that are supposed to eat grass, but instead of, because of the subsidies, uh, large subsidies of commodity corn growing, it's cheaper to bring the cows inside and feed them corn and ground up animal parts than to let them have their natural diet of, of grass. So I switched to all grass-fed beef. And eventually, I looked at my menu and I thought to myself, well, I'm finished now. We have a cruelty-free menu, and no other restaurant in town does this. This can be our market niche. Uh, but then I said to myself, well, Judy, if you really do care about those pigs, and if you care about the small family farmers that are being driven out of business, you care about the workers in these horrible factories and slaughterhouses, uh, if you care about the environment that's being polluted by this concentration of manure, and you care about the consumers you know, who are eating meat that's full of antibiotics and uh, growth hormones, then you would not keep this as your market niche, but rather teach what you know to your competitors. <laughs> Thank you. It was no longer enough uh, to just be having the right practices within my company. I had to move from a competitive mentality to one of cooperation in order to build a whole local economy based on humane and sustainable farming. So I asked the farmer who was bringing in the pork, uh, would you like to grow your business? And he said, yes. And I said, what's holding you back? And he said, I need $30,000 to buy a refrigerated truck. So I loaned him the $30,000. And then I formed our nonprofit, White Dog Community Enterprises, and hired our first staff person, Ann Carlin, whose job it was to go around to the other restaurants in town and talk them into buying from local farmers. And that's how we began. I started putting 20% of my profits into our nonprofit work, and Fair Food has grown to uh, publish a local food guide, connect hundreds of farmers and restaurants. We have a farm institution program and many, many other things. Two events took place in the fall of 1999 that caused me to direct my full attention to creating a national movement. The first one was the massive protests in Seattle against the World Trade Organization. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know, know enough back then to go, but my daughter was present, and I, I learned from her about the danger of uh, uh, corporate rules that override um, our locally legislated uh, rules to protect our environment and our workers. I saw at Seattle the environmentalists, the labor union leaders, the farmers, the teachers, the professors, but there was no uh, clear voice of progressive business. We were all uh, protesting uh, against corporate globalization, but there was no alternative vision. So I thought, how can we direct positive energy towards building uh, an alternative to corporate globalization? Only days after Seattle, the second event happened, and I learned that Ben & Jerry's was to be sold to Unilever. Uh, of course, they, it was a forced buyout. They didn't favor doing that. Uh, when it finally sunk in, I literally sat up in bed in the middle of the night and said, oh my gosh, they've got Ben & Jerry's. Uh, <laughs> Ben & Jerry's had always been the leader in our socially responsible business movement, and it was from Ben & Jerry's that I first learned uh, of the concept of a multiple bottom line that measures not just profit but our impact on society. But since the advent of the responsible business movement, uh, even though uh, much progress was made in the concept of the uh, multiple bottom line, the environmental crisis had worsened, wealth equality was worse, family farms were being put out of business by factory farms, family businesses by chain stores and Walmarts. And other companies that had been models of social responsibility had been sold to multinationals, adding to the concentration of wealth and power that the movement was organized to combat in the first place. 
Odwalla juice sold to Coca-Cola, Rhino Records at the time, Warner, Cascadian Farms to General Mills, and more recently, Stonyfield Farms to Group Danan, Toms of Maine to Colgate, and the body shop to L'Oreal. I could see that the socially responsible business movement that I had been part of for years was continuing to use the old paradigm of continual growth uh, to measure our success and had been neglecting important issues like a sense of place, appropriate scale, and ownership. Democracy depends on having many owners. The more owners, the more freedom and equality. <laughs> so now the movement for responsible business has two fronts. Those bringing reforms in the large corporations, such as uh, Ben and & Jerry's and Stonyfield, continue to, to model. And those of us that are working to build an alternative to corporate globalization through the local living economy movement. So that's why six years ago, in the fall of 2001, I co-founded Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And I started with a simple, simple uh, premise that an environmentally, socially, financially sustainable global economy needs to be based on a network of sustainable local economies. In living economies, basic needs are produced at home, while what is not available locally is bought through fair trade relationships so that it supports the local communities where products originate. Bali is now an alliance of over 55 local business networks in Canada and the United States, comprised of over 15,000 locally owned community-based businesses. Building these, <laughs> thank you. And I'll be talking more about uh, Bali at our workshop at 245. Uh, building local economies uh, not only reduces carbon emissions, but at the same time, this is preparing us for a world affected by climate change by reducing our reliance on long-distance corporate supply chains, uh, easily interrupted by adverse weather and social upheaval. The local living economy movement is essentially about decentralization and localization, localization of business ownership to bring economic control back to our communities from faraway boardrooms. Localization of energy sources so that we're not dependent on oil from faraway places and every community has access to locally produced renewable energy. It's about localization of our food system so that we have food security. Localization and decentralization of communications promoting independent media that's free of corporate control. Localization of culture in order to protect local cultures from corporate monoculture. Localization of politics to align economic development with local business ownership and green regional economies and localization of leadership to have many local heroes rather than national icons. Perhaps most importantly, developing communities around the world with local food, water, and energy security creates the foundation for world peace. <laughs> Thank you. If poverty is not being able to provide for oneself, then community self-reliance is our greatest wealth, with an economy providing direct access, access to basic needs. Community self-reliance offers a meeting place for the left and the right of liberals and conservatives because it combines the values of self-reliance favored by the right with the values of community and cooperation favored by the left. Community self-reliance is something we can all commit to working on together as we build a secure future in these changing times of climate change and rising costs of oil. As we build this new uh, economy, this is the time to make great strides towards economic justice. It's important that we help those who have been left out of the global industrial economy find ownership opportunities in the local living economies. We can do this by directing local government and capital towards helping minorities, entre entre minority entrepreneurs start green businesses in their communities to help them gain community self-reliance. In our own businesses, we can mentor and hire young people of color. We can develop purchasing partnerships with minority businesses and have sister relationships with minority-owned restaurants, as the White Dog does, or minority-owned health clubs, as Valley co-founder Laurie Hamill does. We need money to grow living economies. Many of us put our savings into the stock market, uh, but that takes money out of our communities. And when I realized that, I disinvested even from screen funds, screen stocks, and put my savings entirely in the Philadelphia Reinvestment Fund, where my money is loaned out to small businesses and community organizations in my own region. Um, <laughs> thank you. This fund even provided the money to build the wind turbines uh, in Pennsylvania that produce the wind energy we use at the White Dog. I call this getting a living return, uh, not only a financial turn, but the, uh, but the benefit of living in a more sustainable local economy. During debate about climate change and the need to cut carbon emissions, there's often a focus on the costs and the hardships of moving to a low carbon economy. But there's little, little talk of the benefits to our quality of life. We're not talking about going back to the cave age. 
Uh, this is rather about gathering with our good friends and family over delicious and nutritious locally produced food, uh, great meals that we share in a warm, well-insulated home that we get to um, by riding our bikes or walking along uncongested streets or taking public transportation. People go to farmers markets not just to get food, but for the sense of community and a sense of place that comes from it. In her new book, Dancing in the Streets, Barbara Ehrenrich talks about the importance of collective joy and how it is often missing in our industrialized, materialistic society, which she believes has caused an epidemic of depression in our society. We've come to think that a good time has to mean spending a lot of money to travel and be entertained, but we can create more fun in our own communities rather than depending on expensive vacations to faraway places. An example of creating collective joy for me is the many block parties we put on at the White Dog where we dance in the street um, to, at Noche Latino or Rum and Reggae. For many years, we put on uh, our Liberty and Justice for All Ball on Fourth of July Eve out in the street, and I put on a skit called Birth of the Nation where I dressed up as a pregnant colonial woman. So after we had a big meal of locally grown foods, uh, first the Revolutionary War man would come out with his, his drum, and then a midwife with her lantern, and then I came out in colonial dress with clown face and a big stomach that I, where I had a beach ball underneath it, moaning in labor pains, and my midwife helped me into this bed out in the street that was decorated in red, white, and blue, and the audience yelled, push, and uh, <laughs> push. Under the covers, I, I was up in my birthing position, and I s uh, secretly passed the beach ball down through this hidden hole in the bed, and my midwife delivered my two twins, uh, a black woman or a white woman, uh, dressed in red, white, and blue. One said liberty, the other said justice, and they hopped up onto the stage and did a tap dance to Yankee Doodle Dandy, and we <laughs> wheeled out the, s the Statue of Liberty and light our sparklers and saw God bless America. Um, <laughs> These are the, the celebrations that in, increase happiness and build community and historically have been put on by uh, local businesses in my community. The local grocery store always put on the holiday party. Building a sustainable and inclusive local economy is not only about our responsibility to future generations, but about our reconnecting to place and with each other as we build joyful communities, creating local identity through local musicians and artists and creative entrepreneurs, increasing happiness and fulfillment that comes from working collaboratively toward a shared vision. To summarize, the local living economy movement is about maximizing relationships, not maximizing profits. It's about growth of consciousness and creativity, not brands and market share. Democracy and decentralized ownership, not concentrated wealth. A living return, not the highest return. A fair price, not the lowest price. Sharing, not hoarding. Simplicity, not gluttony. Life-serving, not self-serving. Partnership, not domin domination. Cooperation-based, not competition-based. Win-win ex exchange, not win-lose exploitation. Family farms, not factory farms. Biodiversity, not monocrops. Cultural diversity, not monoculture. Creativity, not conformity. Slow food, not fast food. Arbucks, not Starbucks. <laughs> Armart, not Walmart. Valuing life over lifestyle. And as the Earth Charter says, being more, not having more. At its heart, our movement for local living economies is about love, and it's love that can overcome the fear that many may feel in the hard days ahead brought on by climate change and environmental collapse. In my own experience, it was my love of animals that motivated me to challenge the factory farm system and begin building a local living economy in my region. Our power comes from protecting what we love, love of place, love of life, people, animals, nature, all of life on this beautiful planet Earth. And I would say, for the entrepreneurs amongst us, it also is about our love of business. Business has been corrupted as an instrument of greed rather than one of service to the common good. Yet we know that business is beautiful when we put our creativity and care into producing a product or service that our community really needs. Our materialistic society has desensitized us to the suffering that underlies our industrial economic system. We're also desensitized by a false idea of masculinity based on control and domination. We need a more feminine, caring, nurturing approach to life, to bring forth the goddess in each of us, men and women, to allow peace and m harmony to come to our world. <laughs> we must open our hearts and eyes and ears to hear the cry of the pigs in the crates, of a cow for her calf, of animals in laboratories in the fur industry, to feel the suffering of the men, women, and children enslaved in sweatshops, in the rug industry, in diamond and coal mines, and in chocolate production. The suffering of migrant workers in slaughterhouses houses and pesticide-soaked industrial farms. 
the suffering of the people of Iraq, of Nigeria, of the rainforest tribes, everywhere where there's oil and natural resources to be exploited and wars to fought over. Let us hear the cry of the whales, of the polar bears, of the trees, of the natural world that's dying around us. What provides the energy and passion for all we must do in this movement is simply to allow ourselves to love what we love, and in so doing, find our place as humans in the family of life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>